just in the law. But he brought us grace. And I want to challenge you to explore the many uses of the word grace within the scripture. I mean, this is broad. This may be the broadest thing you've ever tried to look at. But I want to explain to you something that Brother Woody Wilson, uh, Wilson Woody, Brother Woody Wilkerson shared many years ago. And at first I rejected it. And as I learned Christ, I received it. And it was this. That one of the ministries of grace is the manner in which something is delivered. You either bestow a grace which is given to you by God or you don't. Some people are very clumsy in their delivery of information. I mean, they, like they can get you the information, but it's not palatable. It's intolerable sometimes. They'll beat you over the head. I used to have these friends who were hard shell Baptists, primitive Baptists, and they would just beat you over the head with Scripture, and you didn't want to receive it at all. But when Jesus spoke, it was with grace. And whether he was saying, like the passage that came to my mind just a few minutes ago, suffer the little children to come unto me. Oh, I love that singing, didn't you? Or whether, whether he was saying, unless you repent and become as one of these, you shall in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Or maybe he was talking about the millstone being put around somebody's neck regarding offending one of these little ones. He says, they have an angel who is before the throne. I like being friends with children. I like being friends with anybody who has an angel before God. I like that thought. But anyway, when Jesus said those things, it was done in a manner of grace. But it wasn't just the smooth delivery that represented grace because sometimes he spoke to scribes and Pharisees and spoke to them in a very harsh manner. But that was grace also. And the reason why is because everything he said, he said in the matching appropriate manner. Learning Christ is about learning grace. That's, that's tougher. There was a man, Stephen, you know, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, but he was also filled with grace. And he said, well, it didn't sound like he had much grace that day he got stoned. Oh, yes, he did. And he said what was right, and he said it in the right manner. As you learn Christ, you will learn not only what to say, but how to say it. Not only what to do, but how to do it. And that's just one aspect of grace. Now, there within this text is this idea that in learning Christ, I stopped doing this and I started doing this. Now, this is not a new thought in Scripture whatsoever. In fact, you can go from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament and you'll see this repeated over and over again. One of my favorite passages in the Scripture over the past 10 years has become what the Lord gave to Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 where he says that we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And that we have also participated in the divine nature. It's said that in the opposite way, but I understand it in that way. I have to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust in order to be able to participate in the divine nature. Because I can't participate in the divine nature if I'm participating in the lust of the world. Christ has done this for me. The very first thing that I learned when I think back is the fact that the world and everything in it is passing away. Therefore, i got to escape from it. The next thing I learned was that the kindness of God appeared to me and said, let me tell you what, I'm going to let you participate with me. Have you ever felt the love of being chosen for something? Yeah. It was a very loving remark for you to be able to participate in the divine nature. I am so sorry that pe many people in the churches have not been taught that they have any participation in the divine nature. That God is there and we are here and never the twain shall meet. It's almost that bad. But no, we are partakers or participants in the divine nature in Christ. Now Paul told the church at Corinth, he says, Come out and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch any unclean thing. That's escaping the corruption that's in the world through lust. He says, I will receive you and be a father unto you and you'll be my sons and my daughters. That's a participation. That's a partaker. 
James understood a very similar thing like that with what the Spirit gave to him. He says, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's the same idea here. This is what you don't do, this is what you do. It's a package deal. You can't have one without the other. You cannot participate in the divine nature without escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust. And it does you no good to think you can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust if you don't participate in the divine nature because in the end there's going to be nothing else. So it's time to get on board where you need to be right now. Today there are many people who call themselves Christian. This is a global thing. Christian has a lot of different meanings in our world today. You know, it's kind of interesting in the scripture because the word Christian is used three times and not once it's really used as a complementary term. However, today it's supposed to mean something very good. And it can if you allow it, but you can't trust the word without knowing the person. But these so-called Christians have very strong convictions regarding their title. And these Christians will defend what they believe and stand toe-to-toe against others. Because in their mind, they are educated, they have learned things about Jesus, and they have an obligation to do something. Now those people who are of the academic field and know things about the Bible will stand toe-to-toe against atheists, against people who are up against Christ, but they don't do it for the purpose of changing them, but for sounding right. It's a game to them. Then there are other people who are somewhat less knowledgeable of the Scripture, but what they will do is they will stand toe-to-toe against other people who call themselves scriptures, uh, Christians excuse me, just to try to prove that their brand of Christianity is inferior to their brand of Christianity. But I'm going to tell you that neither one of these approaches shows that either one of them has learned Christ. Because when you learn Christ, here is what you learn. You learn to lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance to the lusts of deceit. And being renewed in the spirit of their mind to put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. This is learning Christ. It doesn't doesn't have anything to do with going around proving other people are wrong. It's allowing God to prove you right by what He has done with His Son in your life. I, there was a time I used to revel in the idea of worthless name calling and finger pointing arguments and there is nothing to be gained in that. But it should be clear that there are no denominations and no non-denominations who have cornered the market on learning Christ. There is no particular shibboleth or nomenclature of man, way of saying things that makes this person right and that person wrong. And if you think that by using the right terms, which are created by man associated with a group of people, shows that you've learned Christ, you're wrong. While learning Christ does mean that you have a correct understanding of true doctrine. Having a correct understanding or that of true doctrine does not mean you have learned Christ. There are many people who go around touting Bible truth in this world. It doesn't mean that they are in Christ or that they've ever sat at the feet of Christ. They've just learned it. And some of them's doctrine is right on. It's just that they're dead. There are examples within the scripture that reveal to us what it means to learn Christ. As a matter of fact, you can go through just basically any book in the Bible and you can see examples of how this works. You will see how believers learned Christ. You will see how non-believers did not learn Christ. You will see why we are to learn Christ and whose idea it was for us to learn Christ. You will see who does not want us to learn Christ and you will also be acquainted with the helper who teaches us to learn Christ. You will also find out why we are opposed by evil when we want to learn Christ and what happens when people learn other things besides Christ. You'll find out what is going on in us while we're learning Christ and also what's going on in us when we're not learning Christ. What will happen to those who do not learn Christ but most importantly, the most promising is what will happen to those who do learn Christ. 
This is an exhaustive term. Exhaustive phrase. Exhaustive thought. And this world does not have enough days to speak of it. But the good news is that in eternity, when we only have one day, 